Hi, this is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for joining me for this week's episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. And today, I know something about you. I know something about you and the way that you mix. Unless you are like one of the most seasoned pros out there, one of these people at the top of their game whose phone is ringing off the hook to mix stuff, there's something that you're not doing enough of. I can say this with almost complete certainty, and it is that you are not automating enough. You're not using enough automation in your mixes. This has been true for me. It's been true for so many people until they got to a certain level as a mixer. And it's really one of those things that separates kind of just kind of good enough mixes from really great ones that really work and feel like they work for every moment of the tune with the mix never getting in the way of the production and the delivery of the emotion and the impact of the song. Automation is absolutely huge. But there's a key thing to recognize here, which is that you generally don't want to start with automation, except for in a couple of cases. It's usually best to leave automation till a little later on in the mix, but to not leave it off, which so many people do. And I'm going to bring up a couple of the most common mistakes, the most common errors that people make when they leave off automation. And I'll give you a few things to listen for in your own mixes, where if you just take a few extra minutes to automate these constantly forgotten things, you're going to be so much happier at the results. It's worked for me. It's worked for so many of my clients who are mixers as a mastering engineer myself. And it's just one of these things that can really transform you. So let's get right into it before we do the briefest of shout outs to our sponsors. Because you like mixy stuff, you should check out Sound Toys and make some of my favorite creative effects in the known universe. Try out anything they make for free for 30 days over at soundtoys.com. Also, FabFilter sponsoring this time. FabFilter makes wonderful plugins as well. I just recently did a video a couple months ago where I mastered some entire tracks using nothing but FabFilter plugins, and I was surprised by just how well those turned out. I'll actually link to it here on the screen in the show notes down below. They've just come out uh, with a latest version of their Delay Timeless 3. Great delay as well, but they've got awesome just compressors, EQs, saturators, ton of great stuff in there. Last but not least, Jay-Z microphones. I'm talking right now into my Vintage 67, one of my favorite mics I've got around here. I use it on the podcast a lot. I've used almost every one of their major mics on a podcast episode, and I've done a video about each of them. So check those guys out. There's actually a sale going on right now, their summer sale. You enter the code SONICSCOOP at checkout. You can get free shipping on top of, I think it's like up to 50% off of some of the mics. So definitely check that out. Go to jzmics.com and don't forget to enter the code SONICSCOOP at checkout for your free shipping on top of your huge summer sale discount. All right, let's get into it. Automation. Man, this is one of the things where so many people leave it off and when they start doing it, they're like, why, why didn't I listen? Why didn't I start automating more often sooner? But generally speaking, when you're mixing, the best practice is going to be to dial in what people these days refer to as a static mix, an overall mix of the song first, where you kind of go in, just mess with levels, maybe just mess with pan, put on your bus processing, maybe really just get an overall level setting that kind of works for the whole track. And then maybe from there you start dialing in EQ and additional compression and other effects. And that's an order of operations I generally recommend. But you would be mistaken to think that you're going to get a great mix, the mix of your dreams, by just picking one level for everything and expecting it to work for the entire song. I mean, let's think about it. the kick drum level that you spend, you know, however long perfecting and getting just right in that dense chorus section. Is that kick drum level that's just getting through the mix when everything but the kitchen sink is playing all at once? Is that going to be the right level in a more sparse verse section where there's like half as much instrumentation? Or maybe could that kick come down? Same thing with your vocal. I mean, the vocal in a sparse intro section where it's just like the vocal in one instrument, is that necessarily the right level for the vocal during the screaming chorus when everything's going on at once? There are going to be often somewhat significant changes in instrumentation throughout the course of a song. And not just that, but changes in intensity. There's also going to be changes in the intensity of the the one element, the vocal. Sometimes singers sing louder, sometimes they sing more quietly. 
Yes, things like compression can control this. Uh, things like individual compression on a vocal track or overall bus compression on the whole mix can control this to a degree. But it's usually not enough to make everything really sit well throughout the entirety of the song. And for that, you're going to need to automate. But automation is not only for levels, for getting your levels right. It can also be for effects. And we'll look at a couple of options there. Before we go into it, the effect side, I want to stick with levels for a second to point out a few of the most common things that aren't automated, but probably should be. And the big number one numero uno, what's it going to be? What do you think? It's going to be vocals. I'll go ahead and tell you the other big ones for me are the other two things that people complain about not being able to get to sit right very often, and that's bass and kick. And vocals, bass, and kick, often people complain about them sitting right because in my humble opinion, they're the three of the elements that are most begging for automation most of the time. The other one I would add onto that would be cymbals as being another big one. Potentially percussion fills like tom fills on a live kit. And also solos, kind of featured elements that are sometimes supposed to take the lead in some mixes won't sound featured enough or other elements may be masking them. And I'll get into some examples for all of those for you. So vocals, that's the number one thing that people forget to automate and should. And let me give you an example of a master I was just working on just earlier today. I was doing a revision for a client. He sent me a new mix because he took some of the feedback I gave him, which was about automation. In this particular mix, it was wonderful. In the chorus, they had these background vocals that were really big, and they almost overtook the lead vocal. And that wasn't exactly my problem. It's okay, potentially, to have background vocals being even more dominant than your lead vocal. It's uncommon, but if you're going for that for like an aesthetic choice and you think it's working and it's awesome, do it. The problem was that when the background vocals weren't there, when that whole dense chorus section with the background vocals and the lead vocal, when they weren't there, the rest of the vocal just sounded really small by comparison to this kind of big chorus section with all the voices going on at once. This is a great example for why you would automate. Maybe you want your lead vocal to be a little quieter than maybe you'd expect it to be in the chorus and you have big background vocals, but if you keep it that way for the whole song, it's just the vocal is going to not really carry you through the rest of the song. It's just going to sound small compared to that big chorus. So when that lead vocal is by itself, it might need to be juiced up in level so that it's at a closer level to the big vocal section. So that's just one example. Another example may be kind of the exact opposite, where say you have more traditional thing, primary lead vocal going throughout the entire song, and that vocal is sitting really well in the verse. Well, as soon as the chorus hits and all these other instruments come in, now all of a sudden the vocal is getting a little small, a little swallowed up, and it doesn't seem to have the same size or importance in the mix anymore. So when you hit that chorus, now you actually want to bring that lead vocal up. And what will happen is that it won't sound like the lead vocal got louder. It will feel like the lead vocal stayed at the same relative level. But to do that, you had to make it louder. The other thing might happen if you are focusing on your mix, getting your static mix in the chorus section, where you have the lead vocal sitting really well in the chorus section, but then when you get to the verse, man, the relative level of the vocal during the verse is so loud because you had it set for what was right for the chorus. So automating that vocal down in the verse makes sense. So this is something to look for. The relative importance, relative dominance, relative size of each element throughout the course of the mix. And sometimes to keep it at the same relative feeling importance or size, you're going to have to ride the levels up or down depending on what's going on around it. So you don't end up with two loud vocals in the verses and two quiet vocals in the chorus is one example. But with vocals, there's another layer of complexity, much more so than with something like kick or bass, and that is dynamics. I just talked to you about something I call macro dynamics, right? Macro dynamics being the section to section changes where your verse vocals might want to be a little lower than your chorus vocals or vice versa. 
The other thing that can happen is more microdynamics, where particular words or phrases might poke out a little bit too much. Isn't it the compressor's job to catch that? Like, yeah, to a degree it is, but compressors aren't perfect. And sometimes, if you have a really dynamic vocal, you could be asking for the compressor to do too much to that vocal, especially in very dynamic vocal performances with a lot of passion and pathos in them. In these cases, it can actually help to automate before you even hit the compressor. So most of the automation I'm going to be talking about is going to be post-compression automation, like you get the compressor to smooth things out to a degree, and then you're putting in a degree of automation afterwards. That's the dominant role of automation in most mixes. But in particular in vocals, I've been finding it increasingly useful to go in in Pro Tools or something called Clip Gain. There's other DAWs have their own nomenclature for it, but the idea of actually kind of leveling the waveform before it even hits the compressor. So your compressor is more consistent. So you don't have some places where the compressor is really working hard and some places where it's barely touching anything at all, where you have these significant shifts in vocal tone, which might not be appropriate for all styles of mix. So that's something that can be super helpful. But then after the compressor, you still might want to just goose up a word or two. And that's something I want you to start listening for really critically in your own mixes. Like listen through to the verse and say, could I goose up? or goose down a particular word or phrase by a dB or two, what words just aren't standing out in the same way? And this is a problem sometimes we have with mixing where we just get this general sense of like, uh, something here is not right, and we fiddle. And I want you to get out of that mindset as much as possible. Instead of thinking, uh, something's not right, let me fiddle, start thinking, what exactly isn't right? What exactly is bothering me about the vocal in this verse? Is it too bright, too fat, too thin? Those are, you know, things that you can address with EQs and other processors. But it might be, oh, it's just when he gets to this line. Well, why not just do something about that, that line? And that's what automation is for. And a lot of people don't start doing that until too late. Like they've already hit the intermediate stage. They're getting fairly good results, but they feel a difference between their totally passable work and the really inspiring stuff that they're comparing their work to. And this kind of automation, this kind of thinking through the emotional arc of the vocal, absolutely huge. Now, the next two big elements for this are kick and bass kick, it's that same kind of thing as the vocal, usually on a more macrodynamic level, where there's going to be significant arrangement changes, often in a lot of interesting mixes. And when that happens, your kick drum, when you don't have the bass playing, might need to be at a totally different level than your kick drum when the bass is playing. That could be an obvious one. But generally, when things get more sparse, you can turn down some elements. And when things get more active, you might have to turn things up slightly. But this also gets to the idea of now potentially having different EQ settings for different parts of the song. Just like you might have to goose up some key elements when a lot of things are playing, if you still want them to be dominant when everything's going, you might need to brighten up key elements when things get really dense. And you can let them be a little bit thicker and fatter when things are a little bit less dense. That's like the next level of treating automation, of approaching it from an EQ perspective. Should I have slightly different EQs or tones for these elements in different sections? And in really dense mixes, really ambitious mixes that have a lot going on, high production values, that kind of thing might be necessary. Whether you do that with multiple plugins on one track, automating the bypass on each of those plugins section to section, that's one good way to go about doing it. Some other people will take, say, two separate tracks, one for their chorus kick, one for their verse kick, and then treat those separately. That's another way to handle it. So whichever workflow method you prefer, that kind of approach can be a good one. Now, the other big thing for both macrodynamics and microdynamics, a tricky one, is when you have cymbals and high percussion. And this is particularly the case when you got a live drummer. They're not always going to be super well balanced. Unless you're working with some of the best drummers out there, there might be certain crashes, certain fills that are just a little bit too loud. You've set a good overall level for your overheads, but there's just this one crash that happens in the section again and again, 
and that crash is too loud and too bright. This is a place to consider automating. Things like overheads and symbols. This might be required on a macrodynamic level when you're going from a section with like a closed hi-hat. You got the level great for the closed hi-hat, but when that drummer starts playing that open hi-hat and he or she is playing a little bit harder and there's a little bit more wash in the sound, a little bit more volume in the sound, they're not lightening up on their technique when they open the hi-hat. The hi-hat now gets really loud. So you might need to automate section to section. Hey, I'm going to pull down this hi-hat mic or these overhead mics just when we're in the open hi-hat section. And I'm going to pull it down just when we're hitting these couple of crashes that really leap out. Instead of going in there and saying, oh man, the cymbals are too loud. Let me pull down the overheads for the entire mix. Just go in there and pull down the hits. And this sounds obvious, right? Once I say it out loud. But how many times have you not done that, right? I can look back at the many years of me doing this stuff and look back at many times where I should have just automated something down and instead I just brought down like the entire level. Oh, I guess I didn't have a good level for the overheads because those cymbal crashes were loud. Let me bring down the entire overheads. And then you keep on mixing and 30 minutes later you're like, hmm, you know what? I really wish I was hearing more overheads and more natural tone in this drum kit. Let me bring the overheads back. And then you get to this section where the cymbals get bashed again and you're like, ah, those cymbals are too loud. Let me bring down the entire overheads overheads again. Have you done this before? Chances are that you have, because I know I have, okay? And it's the same kind of thing with bass. Now, bass and kick are a little tricky because your room can throw you off and lie to you. And it can tell you that notes are jumping out that really aren't jumping out. But sometimes notes really are jumping out at you. And it might be the case, like in the room where you recorded, particularly if you're recording like a bass amp, or just the way the player played, or the resonance in the instrument, when they play that F, or whatever it is, that F leaps out louder than other things. And you've been able to maybe look at a frequency analyzer to verify it's not just your room lying to you, it's there in the signal. You can go ahead and just dial down that F when it hits. That might be a little tedious to do with a mouse, but it's one of those things that can be tedious, but absolutely worth it. It could also be the kind of thing where most of the time the bass is playing something pretty sparse, but every once in a while it does this beautiful little melodic fill up high and no one's ever going to hear it because when you have the bass at a good level for the whole track, that fill doesn't really come out. But if you just go in there and goose up that fill, you're in great shape. That's another awesome place to look for this kind of stuff very often is on bass. Also, it can happen in really dense sections when you get, start to get really ambitious and you start to really love this whole idea of doing automation because you realize how important it is. You can go into a dense section and kind of shift the focus of, say, a particular chorus where in the beginning of this chorus, you're kind of featuring this guitar that's on the left side. Maybe you're pushing it out even further to the left so it becomes even more apparent and you're bringing its level up and then kind of as the chorus gets halfway through, its level comes down and something maybe on the right side or the center kind of comes slightly more into focus and you're doing it in a somewhat subtle way just so the listener has different things to focus on at different times within the same section. You can really zoom out very far and also think about the same thing from chorus to chorus. Should chorus two be exactly the same as chorus three? Even if it was recorded and produced that way, are there little things that could happen in the mix to differentiate chorus two from chorus three? Could you automate in some mutes during chorus two to kind of drop out an instrument that only plays the whole way through in chorus three? That's a little bit more of a producer decision, and unless the artist or band really trusts you, they might get a little squeamish about you making those changes. Hey, I noticed we didn't hear our shaker that we really like the whole way through chorus two. What happened to that? You know, they might say stuff like that. So if you're going to do that kind of thing where instruments drop out, you know, I recommend notifying them when you send them the mix to listen to. Like, hey, one of the things I did was in chorus two, I felt like it was really cool if that shaker didn't go the whole time, but just dropped in at this bar and then it would be there the whole way in chorus three. And that to me helped to heighten up the song. Like you might want to prep them for that because people really get demoitis and listen for the, hey, there's something missing that was in my demo, that was in my rough mix. So that's one caveat I'll throw out. But if you're able to communicate those changes well and the reasoning for them, or if you know that you have a lot of trust from the people you're doing a mix for, then absolutely think about that kind of stuff. Sometimes the art is in 
the reduction from section to section to give, again, the overall emotional arc to the song more power, more pull, making sure that things feel like they develop over time. Now, we've talked a lot about different instruments. I want to get into effects. The last thing I got to say before I do is something I've mentioned before in this podcast, which is when there is a solo instrument, make sure it feels like a solo instrument. Please make sure that your hi-hat is not louder than your guitar solo. I've said this this exact phrase so many times in the podcast because it's something I hear often in kind of, you know, new mixer work, literally having hi-hats that are louder than guitar solos. That is something to look for. And it's not just in the rock genre. It's kind of across genres when sometimes you can have something that should be a lead featured instrument, but it's not mixed like one. And something that should be an obviously supporting instrument isn't mixed like one. And this often happens because people aren't automating. They set up those hi-hats or, you know, that high percussion instrument. So it sounded great when everything was dense and they didn't think about what the level that same element should be like when things were slightly less dense. And now there's a solo going on Whether it's a guitar solo or a you know, synth solo or a synth lead that comes in, whatever it is, making sure that in that solo section, you're having things that aren't the solo, take a back seat to it. If they're really supposed to be supporting elements that are just adding to the groove, make sure they're, not, they're doing that and not detracting from the power and the awesomeness of that featured instrument in the section where it's supposed to shine. That's a good segue into the last general area I want to talk about for automation, which is your effects. It can be so cool to have little throwouts here and there this is something a lot of people don't do often enough because it would take all this setup they feel like to do like, oh, all right, it would be cool to have like a repeat on this vocal here, but I've gotten so far into mixing this song and now I'm supposed to put up a quarter note delay and find the right time for it. And then I've got to make sure I enable the bypass on that delay and stuff. This is why I recommend that you have a template. It's one of the many reasons I recommend that you have a template that you mix with, that already has like a quarter note delay loaded up, an eighth note delay loaded up, a half note delay loaded up, a whole note delay loaded up. So you can just grab a send and automate in a send to that delay when you think of it. So there's not this like barrier in your way that makes you say, oh, I'm near the end of the mix and I have to go through this stuff to do something that would be really awesome. I'm just not going to. I know that I've done that. I know that you have too. So it's a great reason to have this stuff set up in advance. So there's fewer obstacles to you automating little delay throws like that. In addition, you can also have reverbs kind of swell and recede over time. You can have a, a solo that kind of builds in reverb as it goes along, or you can have a snare drum that has more reverb in a certain section and is drier in another section. And that's another thing that people don't look at. We talked about the overall apparent size of the main instrument, like making sure the vocal feels like it's the same relative level and size the whole way through requires automation. Making sure that the vocal reverb or the snare reverb feels equally wet the whole way through can also require some section to section automation. But you might want to go above and beyond that and have certain sections get wetter than others. Now, the one thing that you're often not going to automate, in my experience, is compression and limiting. But of course, there's always exceptions. If you are going to automate compression and limiting. Usually it's because at certain times you want there to be an over compressed sound or at certain times you want there to be a ton of limiting because everything got really dense and now we need to make sure that this thing is just super dynamically controlled. One of those two things is often happening when you're going to automate it. And when that's occurring, I would generally recommend like a second compressor or limiter plugin that you would turn bypass on and off on. I find that that's often the way to kind of make it the most seamless. Because when you start automating ratios or thresholds, I find that the results can be a little less predictable than you want. And I often find that having two alternate compressors or two compressors stacked on each other, sometimes turning on the second one when you need more compression or more limiting, you 
activate that second one, that's often a better strategy for when you want to create extra dynamic control or a special effect of overcompression, overlimiting during different sections of just having one that completely turns on and off on that particular element. Last quick note I'll give you is this also applies to mastering. And it's something I have to remind myself to do in mastering of not being lazy and saying every once in a while, hey, when we go from the verse to the chorus, I want to goose up the entire track by a half dB or bring it down by a half dB. Or I might find that there's a problem where the mixer should have automated their symbols but didn't. So in the chorus, I can't have as much high end as I'd like relative to the verse. And I have to use more of like a de -er or slight darkening EQ in one area in the chorus, maybe just on the left side to control the symbol or whatever it is. I might have to have slightly different EQ settings for different sections. And I may need to goose up and down the overall level of the track, often by as little as a half dB or a dB to make things feel even more consistent or to kind of amplify the dynamics and the emotional arc of the song. So if you're mostly doing mastering, you can still think about automation, even in that context, particularly on things like EQ, dynamic EQ, and level setting. Well, I hope you go forth and start automating stuff. It really is one of these things that people leave off way, way, way too much when they are mixing. And it's one of those things where you just put in 10, 20% more time at the end of the mix, and it really goes from just okay to, man, we're hanging with the big boys and girls right now. This is how mixes are supposed to sound. And this is what I wish I had been doing for years and years before, because that's how it felt to me when I finally really started doing this stuff properly in my own work. Big shout out to you for making it this far. Remember to hit like and subscribe if you haven't already. Hit that notifications bell so you don't miss any more great episodes like this one. If you are an audio-only version like Apple Podcasts or Spotify or anything like that, please consider going in, giving us a rating and review. It really does help spread the word. Big thanks again to Sound Toys. Try out anything they make for free for 30 days over at SoundToys.com. We've done some videos on mixing songs with nothing but Sound Toys plugins, which turned out pretty awesome. And... Our other sponsors for this week, FabFilter, who just come out their Timeless 3 latest iteration of their excellent delay. I also have a video where I master a few songs using nothing but FabFilter plugins, and those turned out really well as well, so check those guys out. I'm also talking right now into a Jay-Z microphone. There's a big summer sale on these. Hurry up and don't wait because it is going to and right near the end of June. So get on, use the code SONICSCOOP at checkout to get free shipping on top of up to 50% off some of their microphones. And they do sound wonderful. Got audio examples of so many of their mics right here on this channel. If you want more free stuff from me, you can get it. First of all, go to sonicscoop.com slash contest where we give away more than $100,000 worth of free gear every year. We've also got a workshop for you called the Five Habits of Truly Great Mixers. These are the things that truly great mixers do on every single mix. You want to be making sure you do them too. Get that sonicscoop.com slash mixhabits. That's sonicscoop.com slash mixhabits. Spoiler alert, one of them is automating. All right, we've also got a workshop on intro to mastering called Mastering 101 over at sonicscoop.com slash Mastering 101. If you want to know what mastering is all about and how to get started doing it yourself or just be more confident about that part of the process, even if you're having someone else do it for you, you got to check that out over at sonicscoop.com slash Mastering 101. If you want to go even deeper, I do have the full length courses Mixing Breakthroughs now and it's 2.0 iteration. It's super awesome. You have tracks there that you can mix yourself and you get a full roadmap to mixing, including even more detail and audio examples and precise ideas on how to automate. So check that out over at mixingbreakthroughs.com or my full-length course on mastering over at masteringdemystified.com. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for hanging out with me. See you next time.